we are talking today about a concept um I don't know how many of y'all have heard of this. It's sort of a new, not fairly new uh, concept that's that's floating around out there called crime prevention through environmental design. And kind of in a nutshell, it's basically just thinking about how we design our buildings and our our public spaces to deter criminal behavior or un, undesired activities. And so <clears throat> it's actually using physical built environment and features of the built environment to uh, kind of control behaviors and inf really influence behaviors, I guess, more than control behaviors um, and reducing the opportunity for people to take advantage of, um, you know, bad design to commit crimes and, and do unsavory things. So, um, probably relatively quick lecture today, um, but at least it's worth uh, introducing this concept to y'all and um, just getting it out there. So, all right, clicking on this here. So it's basically, like I said, they're using the built environment to create safer buildings and neighborhoods by reducing the opportunity for crime and enhancing the feeling of safety in the environment. So it's not just about reducing the potential for criminal activity, it's also about enhancing the feel, the safety feel, or um, making people feel safer in an environment by, you know, things like lighting and landscaping and all of that, because the safer people feel in a space, the more likely they are to go there. And of course, the more activity you have in a space, the less opportunity there is for criminal activity to occur. So it's kind of working both angles, one in, in the physical design actually reducing the negative behaviors, but also by improving the feeling of safety, you increase the level of activity and that in turn reduces criminal activity. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> um, and it's, you know, relates to things like observation, access, defining boundaries, and we'll talk about all this. So if you look at the picture here on the left, you know, by having these overgrown hedges in the front of the house, basically what you've done is you're creating a hiding space. So if someone were to want to break into this house, you know, they could do it pretty well unobserved from the street because that overgrown hedge makes kind of gives them a place to hide while they're doing their, you know, bad things. Whereas on the right, you can see by clearing out the vegetation, you open up the accessibility and the visibility of the porch to the street and you enhance safety. And in turn, you've also improved the visibility from inside the house out to the street. So the people inside can see what's happening outside and that can help reduce um, any sort of unwanted behaviors happening on the street because it increases the likelihood that somebody inside could see it happening. So it works both ways. So there's two assumptions that go into this idea of crime prevention through environmental design. First is that offenders commit crimes when there's not many people around, when they're unlikely to be seen, right? People don't want to have an audience for breaking the law. And crime is related to daily routines and activities, such as flow of traffic and pedestrians on nights and weekends. So again, it's about reducing the opportunity for people to, to do things unseen and un noticed and it's increasing the lawful and legal activity in an area to reduce the opportunity for people to commit bad crimes. So if you think about um, our conventional development patterns, right, if you think of your typical single family neighborhood on a weekday, kids are in school and since in most families both spouses work, most single family subdivisions are basically empty during the day during the week right because mom and dad are at work the kids are at school and so you have literally entire neighborhoods that are virtually empty and so if you're a criminal that's kind of your ideal environment because you can come and go with little notice because there's just nobody around so that's you know how physical design of our neighborhoods can detract from safety by making them more vulnerable because nobody's around during the day so when we talk about this concept, we want to think about zones and not zoning like we talked about zoning throughout the semester, but these are zones of kind of personal space. 
And so you have your private zone. So that would be like inside of your house, right? Inside of your house is your private zone. It's where you go when you don't want people to, to see you, right? That's um, semi-private would be like a front porch or a front yard where, you know, it's your, still your property and your, your, your personal space, but it's visible to the public. It's accessible to the public. And so, um, you know, the activities you would conduct on your front porch are probably different from the activities you would conduct in your bedroom, or at least you hope so. And then public space is, you know, the sidewalk, the street, the park, the transit, you know, riding the bus or the train or whatever. And so we want to ensure that we can, um, you know, if we distinguish between these different zones, we can influence behavior within those zones. So when you want to have privacy in your own home, you can close your blinds, you can close the door and you can, you know, be unseen. Your semi-private space on the porch, you know, you can't really hide away and do things there, but you know, if you're sitting with your spouse or significant other and you're having a conversation on your porch, you're still pretty limited in who's going to overhear that or see that. And then in public space, obviously, that's when, you know, anybody can come up and, and be part of what you're doing. <clears throat> and so some strategies to think about um, crime prevention or through natural surveillance territorial reinforcement, natural access control, and target hardening. And again, we'll talk about each of these in turn. So natural surveillance is about using design to maximize visibility into and out of buildings and minimizing places for things to happen unobserved in, in hiding places. So you want to increase openness and increase visibility. So like if you look at the picture here on the left, you've got these open trails and obviously, as you can see from the picture, the whole space is visible. So this is the High Line in Manhattan. It's the old elevated rail line that was turned into a linear park. And so when they designed this space, they intentionally kept the landscaping low um, so that people, you know, there weren't like tall bushes and tall trees that people couldn't hide behind. So they made it very easily or very easy to see ahead and behind you so if you're walking in this space you're going to feel very safe because you can see everything that's going on there's not hiding places where somebody could jump out and you know grab your bag or you know rip you off or whatever so and the buildings adjoining it also overlook it making it you know easy, easy to be observed from the adjoining buildings again which reduces the opportunity for somebody who wanted to mug somebody or whatever to get away with it without being seen You also want to think about um, part of natural surveillance is putting eyes on the street. So by designing places where people actually want to be, then you're going to increase the level of activity and have more people in that space watching it. So as you can see from the pictures here on the left, right, you have just a typical alley, you know, dead space, not very attractive, not very appealing. And then you look on the right, they've improved the landscaping, they put in some nice murals, they activated the space so that people will use it as a walkway or a cut through thereby activating it and making it more likely people will be there and turning what had been a dead space where you know un unpleasant things could happen into an active vibrant pedestrian access point so you can see how just some simple changes can can really make a difference in a space and make it more appealing <clears throat> So there's also a social component to this. So it's not just about physical design, it's about the neighborhood and the social capital in that neighborhood. So when people know each other and they have relationships with their neighbors, they're more likely to look out for one another. So think about, you know, maybe if you grew up on a cul-de-sac with neighbors who had kids your age and you were all out playing in the cul-de-sac, chances are, even if your parents weren't outside watching you somebody you know one of the parents was at least paying some attention to the kids playing in the front yard and so by having those relationships across the neighborhood there's always somebody watching out and making sure that you know trouble isn't brewing and so again it's it's a combination of the two the social capital improves the safety and the physical environment can enhance social capital as well by creating an environment where people want to walk and spend time with one another. Um, if y'all remember back to 
when we were talking about traffic and how high traffic streets reduce social capital by reducing interactions between neighbors, <clears throat> right? The physical design that makes it great for cars to go back and forth quickly and, and at high speeds reduces relationships and social capital on the block. So we want to design places that, you know, slow the traffic down, allow people to get out of their houses, walk, meet their neighbors, interact with one another, and start to form those relationships that improve safety. So it's not just about, you know, having relationships for relationships sake. We notice a decrease in crime and an increase in safety when we have high social capital, strong relationships between neighbors. And, you know, the problem that can arise from that, um, you know, when you have a tight-knit community, you can have issues if somebody's, say, visiting and gets mistaken for an intruder, right? So if y'all, I don't know if y'all remember the Trayvon Martin case in Florida where the, the overzealous uh, neighborhood watch guy, Martin Zimmerman, saw Trayvon Martin walking to his dad's house from the convenience store. He'd gone to get a pack of Skittles and Trayvon Martin was black and this was a largely white neighborhood. So this overzealous neighborhood watch guy, Martin Zimmerman, I think that was his name, confronted Trayvon Martin. They got into a fight. Martin Zimmerman shoots, Trayvon Martin kills him and uh, tried to claim self-defense when it was, you know, him being you know, basically singling out this kid for being black walking in the neighborhood. So there are some downsides to uh, some of these sort of overly tight-knit communities uh, that can create some problems, but they're pretty rare. And in general, what happens um, is that tight-knit communities actually are safer than others. So natural surveillance is also about people being able to see in and out, right? So this example here, you see the large windows on the business. That means people inside can see what's happening outside. People outside could see what's happening inside. So if somebody were holding the place up or whatever, you know, that could be seen from the outside and police could be called and, and deal with the problem. So you want to think about how we design spaces to allow for increased visibility as much as possible. And we want to think about lighting. So we want to think about how we can see in evening time, right? So, um, you know, the example here, these lights are pretty terrible in terms of dark skies, um, you know, because they're just shining all over the place, but it does light up the space pretty well. There's some landscaping, but not a lot. So it's not like somebody could really hide out of sight in the trees and, and jump somebody. So this is an example of how you can enhance safety, make a place feel um, more comfortable for pedestrians and others by making sure it's very well lit at night. And the example here of the parking garage, um, by having the chain link fence, you're controlling access so people can't just jump the wall and get into the space, but you are still allows, allowing visibility. So if somebody were in here in trouble, somebody outside could see that and intervene or call the police or whatever. So you want to, again, increase as much as possible people being able to see what's happening around them. <clears throat> so we um, want to think about in, in our homes, we want to think about doorways, windows, driveways, you know, our landscaping is going to influence how well we can see into and out of our homes. And so again, we don't want to have landscaping that creates hiding places where somebody could hide behind, you know, bushes in our front yard as they're trying to, you know, jiggle the window open or, or pick the lock on the front door. We want to make sure that things are visible from the street. So if somebody's trying to do something they shouldn't be doing, they can be seen. Also, when we're like driving into our home, uh, you know, coming up the driveway, we want to be able to kind of surveil what's going on, make sure somebody's not hiding, you know, and going to jump out and mug us as we're trying to get into our house. <clears throat> so businesses you want to think about windows and signage again to make sure there's not you're not you're not blocking observation points and you want to think about inside the store how you lay out the store to make it so employees can see what's going on and make sure you know people aren't doing something in the back they're not supposed to be doing you know filling their their 
jacket full of full of stuff they're stealing or whatever and also you want to just be able to allow employees to see as much as possible so they can be aware if somebody's like coming after them or something they can they can see it and respond sooner than being snuck up upon <clears throat> So territorial reinforcement is about defining space and how we set aside those divisions between you know, public, semi-public, and private space. And uh, fences certainly send a very clear message of, you know, stay out. Now that could be, you know, there is an enormous difference between a you know, 12 foot chain link fence topped in barbed wire versus, you know, a three foot white picket fence around the front yard. Um, they both serve to define space, but one is certainly more aggressive in defining that space and creating an actual barrier to injury than the other. So we want to think about, you know, how we're trying to define the territory and what level of, of reinforcement we want for the message we're trying to send. <clears throat> So you want to, again, define your clear boundaries between public, semi-private, and private space, and even small barriers can influence behavior. So in this example here, you have, on the very left of the picture, you have the sidewalk, which is public space. I mean, it may be technically private property, but it is the public right-of-way. Um, <clears throat> so that's your public space, and you have this landscaping and a short fence, and so that serves as your territorial re territorial reinforcement that you're entering the semi-private space of the front yard you know obviously everything's still very visible it's still accessible I mean that fence isn't clearly going to stop anybody from jumping it and getting into the yard but it defines the boundary between the public and the semi-public or semi-private space and then you go up the stairs and enter into the private space of the home itself so you have very clear delineation between those spaces you have, you know, a short hedge between the two yards, again, demarcating the, the property boundary between those two spaces. So again, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a barbed wire fence, but it can be just a small reminder that there are different zones here and different behaviors expected across those zones. <clears throat> so again, just some different examples here, just a low fence. Again, not really stopping anybody that wants to get into that space, but just defining the boundary of what's public and what's semi-private. Same here, a little bit, you know, harder fence to get over. It's a little bit taller. It's got kind of pointy tops, so, you know, a little harder fence to get over. And then here you've got some signage, you know, defining that this is private property. You've got the gatehouse. So you're clearly demarcating your transition from public space to the semi-private space within this neighborhood. And here you've got the physical bollards, you know, defining, uh, you know, keeping out cars, allowing pedestrians through into that transition zone. And so again, just another example of, of how landscaping can be used as a, as a way to define boundaries. So the low landscaping and fences demarcate the semi-private from the public space, but it doesn't create hiding places. You have these large windows, again, not blocked by tall vegetation that allow for a sight line. So you have that natural surveillance <clears throat> happening and you have interaction from these porches. People can be on their front porch, interact with passersby, you know, talk to their neighbors, meet one another, um, you've got a you know nice comfortable pedestrian environment that's going to encourage people to get out and walk the neighborhood so you're creating that social environment that contributes to safety as well so this is kind of bringing some of these different ideas together you know, you've got lighting as well to make it safer so again bringing multiple ideas together to create an environment that's going to be safer and more welcoming uh, to positive behavior and less accessible for negative behavior And uh, this idea of natural access control is, is using design to limit access to areas where it can be observed and to minimize free access. So in this case here, into this gated neighborhood, they've got you know a fairly high fence running around the neighborhood. They've got the control gate here. And so to get access into this neighborhood, you have to come through this point. So I'm sure there's cameras watching as well. So if you know, homes were to be robbed in this neighborhood, they could go to their video camera, at least probably see the car that did it and start to you know, figure out that crime. It also limits additional access into that neighborhood 
through a control point um, to where it can be regulated. So this is an example of you know controlling access. So you have this little gap here. So if someone say were to, you know, this is a convenience store or whatever, somebody robbed it, they could immediately escape the building, jump down here, be out of sight and, and escaping the property pretty quickly. <clears throat> Um, it's also kind of a hiding point that somebody could, you know, crouch down here, wait for somebody to walk by and jump up and grab them. So you're creating, you know, a couple different issues with this kind of design here. And just by simply putting in a small fence, you can, you know, keep that from happening. You can control access, limit the opportunity for somebody to hide there and jump somebody or whatever. And in this case here, what you have is um, just using these landscape features, you're controlling access into this space. So, you know, you're not building, you know, big walls or big barriers or big fences, but just by simply having these low landscape features, you're actually kind of controlling where people can go within this space and limiting their access um, around. So it can be fairly subtle and fairly unobtrusive to influence how people in and out interact with the space and direct them where they should go and keep them from going where you don't want them to go. So in our homes, we do that through things like walkways. So we, you know, we define the place where it's okay to walk to come up to the front door so people don't approach from, you know, any and all directions. Again, we use our landscaping. So you're defining the edge here in the grass, you've got these landscape lights to kind of control people, you know, stepping off the off the walkway here. Um, you know, when we access our subdivision, as we saw in the previous picture with the gated subdivision access and through our street design. So again, we want to influence um, how people behave and how they get around through, you know, access to the streets. And with our businesses, we want to think about where we locate the cash register and how accessible that is. We want to think about public paths into, out of, and around our businesses through the you know, interior of the store as well, how people can, can move around the space. We want to think about our parking lots because certainly uh, parking lots can be a source of danger for people because you know, there's lots of hiding places behind cars. They're oftentimes not well lit. Um, you know, depending on the type of business and the time of day or night, it could be very low traffic. So there's not a lot of people around to see things that are going on. So lots of opportunity in parking lots for negative behaviors to happen. We want to think about our entrances, roof, roof access, rear access. All of those are opportunities for uh, people to gain access that shouldn't. So we want to make sure that we control all of those different access points. Um, and minimize unwanted access. And so this idea of target hardening is about making it more difficult uh, to rob a place or do something bad. So the easiest example is the club. I don't know if y'all are familiar with these. These were pretty big, boy, probably 20 years ago, maybe was when the club was a big thing. And it's basically just a physical um, tool that you put on your steering wheel and basically it, what it does is you it makes it impossible to turn the steering wheel more than a little bit and the point of this tool on your car was just to make basically a big visible sign to someone trying to break in and steal your car that you know they couldn't do it so the, the feature itself doesn't have to be super functional in terms of actually prohibiting a crime from happening but just the visibility of it can deter a crime because a criminal walking along looking for a car to steal is going to see the club on a steering wheel and say, well, that one's going to take me a few minutes longer to get the club disengaged from the steering wheel as opposed to the next car down the line, which doesn't have one, so I'll steal that one instead. So just that visible symbol or reminder of hardening can make can deter bad behavior. So window locks are a great example. Most window locks are pretty cheap and could be broken pretty easily um, and aren't really so much a deterrence to crime by their physical act of locking the window as much as it's just something that would slow a criminal down and make them think, I'll just go to the next house where the window is not locked. Um, so it's, a, it's really about deterring crime through just visual, visual cues as much as anything else. 
And so target hardening can be a psychological barrier as well, just by, again, making a symbol that there's some kind of wall or barricade in space can deter negative behaviors by just making people think, I'm gonna go find an easier place to rob or whatever. Vehicle barriers, uh, post the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, I think was when that happened. Yeah, it's been 25 years. So 1995 is when the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And that's when you really started to see a push among like, especially government buildings to be less vulnerable to car bombs. And so you started to see these bollard features get built in a lot of places. And so in this case here, these bollards can rise and fall. So you can allow car access into this space when necessary, but otherwise these bollards are in place to uh, keep cars out. And that's again to deter car bombings and, and things like that. So vehicle barriers can help restrict access for sure. And in our homes, we want to think about doors and windows and making those less accessible, less easily accessible. And so like this example here, you've got this, this post that comes across for a sliding glass door that makes it more secure. Um, you know, having visible window locks, visible door locks, those things can, again, just make it um, obvious to a criminal that trying to break into this particular house is going to be harder than the house next door because the locks are better or whatever. And sliding glass doors, this is a cute video. It's short, so I'll show it. <clears throat> there you go. So if you have a cat, you're sticking the sliding glass door trick is not going to work very well. Oops, sorry. There we go. So uh, this is just an example of um, a project where they actually used this idea of crime prevention through environmental design. They changed the physical design of a space that had very high crime rates. Um, so you can see the number of service calls there, number of criminal reports, number of arrests. And so they, they were like, clearly something's going on in this community and they decided let's change the physical environment of this space and see what happens. And so you can see, I mean, the, the signs kind of beat up and run down, the landscaping's pretty rough. You know, it, it looks like there's some landscaping that allows for hidey holes and, and places for people to get out of sight. And so they came in, they changed it up, they opened up, the, sorry, they opened up the space. So they improved the appearance. Um, overall just in general made it look nicer they opened up the visibility of the space so you can see into the space so police officers driving by on the street can look in and see what's going on across the space people inside the space can see across it and see other people um, so you're increasing the surveillance you're reducing the places for people to hide you're making it more accessible you're you're putting in the fence to control access to the site to limited areas and all of those improvements, you know, actively engaged in, in trying to dissuade criminal behavior by changing the physical layout of the property, contributed to a massive decrease in crime. So you had calls for service, 44, 93% reduction, 90% uh, reduction in reports, and a 96% reduction in arrests. So just the physical design changes they made had an enormous impact on the safety of this community. And so those are the kinds of changes that you can see just through changing the physical design of the space. And that's what this is all about. It's about making communities safer, about improving quality of life for people that live in these communities and reducing crime, the need for police interventions and other responses to crime. And so by using these, these ideas of um, crime prevention through environmental design, you can actually start to influence behaviors. And so in these pictures, you can see, um, you know, the, the public space is clearly defined. Where it's acceptable to be is clearly defined through the use of landscaping. So the kinds of plants that we're using are going to minimize people getting off the path and just tromping through the landscaping. 
And so you're influencing behavior through the use of landscaping and other features. So you're also making sure that it's open and easily seen. So as you're walking through here, you can see easily far ahead and you know feel more comfortable and safer in these kinds of environments. Okay, so your activity for this lecture is I want you to draw a site using some of these elements of crime prevention through environmental design. So think about, say, if you were drawing like an apartment complex, for example, how would you lay out the buildings and the landscaping and the access points to maximize your natural surveillance, define your boundaries between public, semi-private, and private space, um, define territories, control access, um, do all of those things uh, that we've been discussing for the last 30 minutes. So go back here to this list. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to... There we go. So you want to incorporate natural surveillance, eyes on the street. You want to think about territorial reinforcement, so defining again that public, semi-private, and private space controlling access and hardening your target to minimize potential for um, bad things to happen. So those are the four elements I want you to think about. And so I want you to lay out a space that um, will do that. Just draw it on a piece of paper, take a picture of it, upload it to Canvas, um, and that'll be the activity for today's lecture. So that's it. Kind of a quick one today, but I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about um, how to apply these principles to a design of your choice. And I will talk to you all next time.